Hey, it's Bex here, and this is Fun Kids Meets, the podcast where we meet amazing people. Now, recently, I caught up with comedian and author David Vidal about his new book, Small Fry, where we meet Burger Supremo Benny, and he's got to find a way to defeat fast food giant Bonkers Burgers, who want to destroy any competition by any means necessary. So, I started off by asking David, didn't you originally have a different name for the book? I, I did think about calling it Burger Boy, but I wrote a book a while ago called Birthday Boy, and it sounds a bit like that. It sounds a bit too similar, uh, but it's not a, a similar book at all. But um, Small Fry is about a boy who works his dad's burger van. His dad runs a not very good burger van outside a not very good football club, uh, and he's been helping him. And then one day his dad, because he's been asking for a while, finally lets him cook the burgers for that day. Turns out he's a brilliant, amazing, natural chef, um, and people come from far and wide to taste the burgers in this grotty burger van. Uh, and then what happens is that the local, not based on any in real life fast food, you know, burger place, uh, it's called Bonkers Burgers. So it's completely different from anything in real life. Bonkers Burgers get to hear about this. They get very angry about it, especially Bodley Bonkers, who runs Bonkers Burgers. Uh, and they basically try and close down the burger van because they don't like the competition. Uh, and it ends in a huge burger off uh, between uh, Benny, uh, who is the little boy, and uh, the greatest chef in the world who Bodley Bonkers hires to uh, be on their side of the burger off. And I'm not going to tell you what happens after that. Uh, t- to be honest, like, I think we could end the interview now. You've done such a good job of telling me about the book. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can tell your practice to this. Now, um, in the book, we've got lovely Benny and also he's got some great friends, got Jasper and Mina as well. Yeah. who are incredibly supportive of this. And his dad, Lenny, is a little less so, would we say? Yeah, well, Lenny is, uh, I like to try and make my, all my characters, kids, adults, whatever, a little bit nuanced and a little bit like, because I've never been of the opinion that if you're writing a children's book, children are very sophisticated now, much more so than when I was growing up, and they get, you know, all sorts of things, irony, sarcasm, all sorts of things, and also complexity in characters. Uh, So Lenny is quite depressed because a while ago, Benny's mum died and so he himself was a cook he's not that bothered about cooking anymore so that's why he's ended up in a burger van and he's not sure about this whole idea of his son becoming a cook at the same time and sorry I don't want to give away everything in the book but there's a vegan subplot uh, because Mina is a vegan and very gradually and very nicely she slightly convinces Lenny that veganism is a good thing Lenny's not so keen on that because that means that Benny is going to start cooking non-meat burgers and he thinks that might have a massive impact on his clientele. Uh, so, yeah, all that's going on as well. Um, I'm not, As I say, by now I think I just want to sort of read the book myself to find out what happens. <laughs> well, are, you, are, you, um, are you a fan of vegan food yourself? Because the way you write about it, it made me very peckish. In general, writing about food made me peckish. In fact, reading it, I read it the other day in front of um, about 500 children and I nearly had to go off and eat a sandwich because uh, writing about food makes you very hungry. And actually, I really liked writing about food. Uh, the book is, I'm just going to say this, uh, influenced by Ratatouille uh, because Ratatouille is an amazing film. I mean, I mean the film, not the dish. Um, and uh, I think that you know, I really like things, art, films, books, whatever about food, because I think food is such a sort of fundamental thing. Also, I really like eating. Uh, and so I was, I liked writing about food. Now, the vegan thing, so I'm not a vegan, and I think I should be a vegan, but basically I do really, really like sausages. But my daughter is a vegan, uh, and I watch her, like, cook brilliant vegan food and just be committed to essentially the ethical treatment of animals. And I think, oh, I should, that's what I should be doing. Um, and I do eat much less meat than I used to. And maybe one day I'll manage to get there, but I thought I'd put it in. I've sort of slightly based Mina on my daughter in, in the sense of my daughter being someone who in a very unmilitant way just makes it clear how eating animals is essentially a, a sort of strange historical thing that I think in future times we'll think, why were we doing that? I get the impression as well. Is it right? Your son gave you the idea for the book as well when he said something at a drive through yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I'm very, very indebted to Ezra, who is my now 19-year-old son, about to be 20. Um, he uh, has given me ideas, I think, for four of my books, including my first ever book, The Parent Agency, uh, when he said, Dad, why doesn't Harry Potter run away from the <laughs> Dursleys and try and find some better yeah. parents? Uh, 
and he said that when he was eight and clearly he was thinking about better parents <laughs> himself but uh that gave me the idea for the parent agency which is by the way about to be a musical uh opening at chester story house in february so i mean i'm presently in auditions for that and that's really exciting but um yeah, Ezra with this one. So we did this thing uh, when it was a like a, we don't do it much anymore. He's got off the idea, but for about two years, uh, he liked uh, going to burger places and playing what I call divorced dad. Uh, by which I mean, we thought it was a divorced dad thing to do for me to just go with Ezra. I'm not divorced, just to be clear. Uh, would go with Ezra to a drive-in McDonald's and just sit and eat burgers in the car park. Now, it really, it was just like we liked eating the burgers, but there was also something kind of weirdly bonding, like I imagine there is between divorced dads and their sons, uh, sitting and eating the burger vans, uh, sitting, and eating, sitting and eating the burgers in this place. So while we were there one time, Ezra said, what do you think the chefs are like in this place? And I said, well, they're fast food chefs. And he said, but what if one of them was an amazing chef? Like he happens to have ended up, or he's young, and he's happened to have ended up at this drive-in. Like would people start coming? Would word get round? Would this drive-in be like the hot ticket for like food it or whatever? And that's what gave me the idea. I didn't want to set it there. Uh, and I brought in this my experience of like eating horrible burgers at football matches. And uh, that's what struck me is what if this was an amazing place? But it definitely, you know, he gave me the idea. And once again, I am indebted to him. I, I've definitely had those burgers from football vans. And actually from like me and my family used to go to the races. The race courses would have like those burger vans there as well. And I've got to say, I was impressed at the uh, family's dedication to keep the prices the same through the book. They did it at the whole way. I was like, well done them. Yeah, and also I think probably incorrect now. I think I'm probably, you know, harking back to my days of regularly having those burgers when they were a bit cheaper than, than they are now. But, you know, the, I think Lenny, you know, he's a good man. Yeah. He doesn't want to extort his customers for what is what is certainly the start of the film, not great burgers uh you know i mean if i if i can talk for a second about a football burger for anyone who doesn't know it's normally completely overcooked it's been sitting in a lot of grease for a long time there's a lot of kind of dirty onions that get ladled on them the the buns themselves are not incredibly kind of dry starch, yeah um, yeah, and but the only and then by the side of the van, there's like enormous, great, squeezy bottles of sort of mayo and mustard and tomato. And the only way to make the burgers at all nice is to completely lather them in those sauces, and then you get covered in sauce as you eat them on the way to the ground. So it's not a great experience. But Benny brings, you know, good meat and good bread and salad and all sorts of unheard things to the van. And that's what makes it amazing. Did you use writing this book as an excuse to go and research, bur- like I say research in inverted commas, to just to go and eat burgers, basically? Yeah, I am. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, actually, so <laughs> this is going to become too mentioning McDonald's, <laughs> but I have an office quite near McDonald's and there's lots and lots of nice, quite posh cafes around there. But I go to the McDonald's and that's partly because they do do a vegan burger. Oh. I mean, I might as well. Actually, I think that's very good. Yeah. I'm just they do a muck plant, uh, and I uh, I really like them. I, I really like them because, like, I don't think you can tell that it's not. I, I'm not going to eat well a proper burger, a meat yeah, burger. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, now I do. I really like burgers. Uh, it's hard, you know, when you get to my age and I'm quite old. You're not supposed to eat unhealthy food, but I love unhealthy food. I love bacon sandwiches. I love fry ups in general, and I love burgers. So any excuse, yeah, including research. Honestly, I I can't even tell you the amount of times this week I've been to McDonald's. So I'm here with you. Like I'm absolutely I'm on board. I'm on that level. Um, and also we have we have Juliana, our lovely chef as well. Is she is she based on anyone in particular, David Badil? Have you called her Juliana? Juli- is it Juliana? No, it's Juliana. Juliana. You said- yeah, there was slight like Frenchness to the way you pronounce Juliana. I think I was thinking of Juliana is um, in vegetables when you Juliana vegetable. Oh, I see. No, but I think it's important to call her Juliana because uh, she is based on someone. She is based on Nigella yes, Lawson. Yes, I knew it. Uh, straightforwardly based on Nigella Lawson, who's a very, very lovely woman who I know uh, and who is obviously a brilliant chef and who I think is just incredibly appealing. Uh, and so, yeah, Benny watches her. She's slightly different. She's not like, you know, it's not completely like Nigella because uh, Nigella's quite posh and actually Juliana's not that posh. Uh, and also Juliana has started out on the internet, just cooking on the internet and has become famous for, for that. Uh, but this is where my kids' books have a certain complexity. As I said earlier, uh, Benny doesn't have a mum. She died when he was young uh, and he watches Juliana and she cooks with love. That's one of the 
she does and makes it clear. And you know, this is never said out loud, but clearly Juliana is a kind of mum substitute for Benny. Um, and they connect through food. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I sort of actually, when I was doing the audio book, um, I, I wanted not, I, I don't, I read the narration in the audiobooks, but we get actors to play the characters. And I tried to get Nigella to play Juliana, right. but she sadly wasn't available. It's always worth a try, though, isn't it? You might as well take yeah. a punt. Speaking of being like inspired by real people, uh, your baddie in this doesn't laugh. He says, ha, ha, ha. And I wanted to know whether you know somebody who does that and you base that on somebody. You don't have to say who, but just wondered. Well, there's a few people... There's a few comedians. I'm not going to say their names. I, wish you would, but I know you don't, you don't have to. There's a few people I know who, when they laugh, they sort of do a, what seems to me to be a fake laugh. And I always find that kind of like passive aggressive. <laughs> like, it's sort of like, sorry, are you laughing at my joke or are you making fun of my joke? Because that seems like, you know, the way that if people want to do a sarcastic laugh, I can remember this from like when I used to do clubs, uh, comedy clubs, right? Is that if you want a really difficult to come back heckle is some going oh, ha 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 that's that's the worst response to a joke right and so i think it's always like someone who can't laugh properly is often like n- either not got a sense of humor or is quite aggressive towards funny right and but the ki- the thing about bonkers burgers and bodily bonkers in general is i also think people who try too hard to be wacky and zany and funny are also not funny. Uh, and so that's, I think, what's going on in Bodley. But having said that, I like Bodley. I think he's, you know, quite troubled and damaged. And as, as, as you know, all that trouble and damage is to do with food, right? It's to do, you, I think you discover later on that he didn't feel loved enough. And, you know, that's why, I mean, when he tastes the Benny Burger, he has a very, very emotional reaction to it. Uh, and that's because he could taste the love in the burger, but it's the love that he didn't have. Um, it's just getting quite complicated now. Uh, so, but it's, that is all in there. Uh, but yes, his ha 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 that he does is meant to be indicative of a man who has no sense of humor. I also hate it when you say something funny and somebody just says to you, "Deadpan, that's so funny." And yeah. is it though? Are you sure? Like- no, that's so good. Well, but I promise you, if you're a comedian, the last thing you want is an audience smiling. They have to make. They have to make a sound. There's no. There's no point in an audience of people who wryly or think, "Oh, that's very good. That's funny." You don't. No, you have to make a sound. Otherwise, I think it's died. Yeah. Like, tell, tell me with your voice, please, not just your face. Tell me with your voice. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's very. I always like like people who are generous with their laughter. Yeah. It's a. It's a big deal. Speaking, by the way, of laughter. One thing that did make me laugh in the book was when. Uh, <laughs> was when Lenny says, that's not very Christmassy. And he says it all year round. I really, really enjoyed that as a thing. Yeah, that's true. Well, that is based on someone, uh, a writer I once worked with, who um, <laughs> if anyone ever suggested stuff in this thing I was writing that was a bit dark and a bit unpleasant, he would say, that's not very Christmassy. But it does, yeah, at any point in the year. I'm going to add that to my lexicon. Honestly, everything I say the rest of the week, I'm just that's not very Christmassy. And just see what reaction we get. I'm very yeah. excited about using that. Thank you for that. Uh, also, by the way, uh, like uh, it's, we're coming up to Christmas, so this isn't quite right. But I have a sense in which Christmas is a thing that, in a way, should be all year round. Like my brother used to work in a place in America called the Incredible Christmas Store, and, oh, I, wow. and when I say he worked there, I mean he worked there in August, right? And I said, well, "Why is the Incredible Christmas Store open all year round?" He said, it "Just is." So, and then I said, "What happens at Christmas? Does it explode? Right? Does it get like there's too much Christmas?" And he said, "No, there's just a lot of people there." But, <laughs> but yeah, the Incredible Christmas Store, I believe in Santa Monica, is open all year round. Uh, so I think it's okay. Also, me and my son also, we watch a lot. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, of the Christmas movies on the Hallmark oh, Channel. I better believe it. Oh, yeah, of course I have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are amazing. Uh, I mean, I, I could watch them and watch them again. I mean, with no problem because it's the same film. The same town has <laughs> been filmed in, the same actors just repeated. Over. I love every second of it. Yeah, I love them because they are so bad. They are a level of badness that is incredibly enjoyable but just so comforting also, also yeah incredibly comforting and so Christmassy I mean if you want to see red and green go and watch those films 
because <laughs> everything is red and green, like from the start, because they kind of get more Christmassy as they go on. And they tend to have people saying, there's not enough lights here. Where's the snow? And you think, what are you talking about? There's loads of lights and snow and everyone is wearing red and green. <laughs> this, this town is clearly based around a Christmas economy. There's nothing you can do to get away from it. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, actually, I say, say all this. I'm going to mention another one. I wrote a book called Virtually Christmas a couple of years ago. Uh, which is about um, a world in which Christmas has been totally taken over by an internet company, again, mentioning no <laughs> names. Um, and uh, and then a little girl starts to think, but where's the real Santa? Uh, and she goes in search of the real Santa, who it turns out has, has signed an NDA and has been kind of pensioned off by Winter Zone, this company. Um, and actually, when I wrote that, it's sort of about my love of Christmas. I'm Jewish, but when I was young, we didn't celebrate Christmas. And then when I got a bit older, I thought, no, no hang on, this massive party happening somewhere else that I never got to have. And now I tend to leap into it like both feet and, and and really like Christmas, which is probably why I watch Christmas films. Oh my, honestly, I could talk to you about Hallmark Christmas films all day because I have a lot of thoughts and I have a lot of opinions about Christmas movies. Um, okay. But I will let you go. But before I do... Um, you might be losing the listenership a bit because some of them may never have seen Everyone's films. seen Christmas films in general. Everybody knows Christmas yeah. films from you know, Muppets Christmas Carol to Elf. Everybody knows them. Yeah, but the Hallmark Christmas films are not... Those films are good films. Yeah, they're, they're, These are yeah. terrible. Oh, yeah. Hallmark's another level entirely, which I yeah. absolutely adore. And we'll start watching from the 1st of November, probably. Um, yeah. But with this book... I, I say all year round, Bex, but hey. I mean, like, I'm not the Incredible Christmas store. What can I say? Yeah. Like, I'm not as incredible as the Incredible Christmas store. <laughs> um, with this book, you've obviously said you've got the parent agency is going to go on stage soon. Would you love to see Small Fry or any other books that you've got kind of going on TV or film or stage? Do you have any other plans? Uh well, there's t- there's often talk about it, um, and so far it's never happened. Well, not never happened. Uh, there was actually a little, really beautiful uh, schools musical of a book I did called Annie Malcolm, which is about a boy who do- thinks he doesn't like animals yeah. and then goes to a farm and turns into lots of animals. And that was a really beautiful little uh, version of that. Um, but no, the parent agency musical is my is the first sort of you know in real life you're going to see the book turned into something else. But I'd love it to happen to to all the books. Actually, I think I've now written eleven children's books, and I'm just waiting for Netflix or some other big company to say, "Let's do the Bedeal verse." I was just going to say the Bedeal multiverse. The Bedeal multiverse in eleven films, uh, all set. They're all set in the same kind of world. Uh, in fact, the school in the parent agency is called Bracket Wood, and now in Small Fry. The ground is Bracketwood FC. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's all it's always in the same kind of little part of whatever city you want it to be that my uh, my children's books are set, uh, and often in in little in books, little characters turn up from other books. I write them quite visually. I mean, I've obviously worked with different illustrators, but brilliant illustrators. But I always think of them as like, yeah, this you know this is a big visual idea involved in in this and it could really work on a screen so i would like to see them on telly oh my goodness well i'd commission it if i had any power at all david Badil, i would commission them immediately sadly i have zero power okay why am i even speaking well yeah I'm not, I'm not useful to you but it was lovely for me to chat to you um thank you so much for telling us about small fry and hopefully i will um speak to you in the next year i feel like you've probably always got a book on the go so i'll probably speak to you for the next one hopefully I've got a possible graphic novel on the go, which will be also, uh, well, it'll be for kids and kind of young adults. uh, And it's about, um, it's about the fact that sparrows don't fly south in the winter, uh, but maybe they might. Like maybe if one sparrow decided that was something that, that sparrows should do, he might lead a team of sparrows to do that. Ooh. that's what it's about what it's called flying south yeah well like so okay i'll tell oh, you I, uh, I, wrote, I actually wrote this as a movie and it never happened and now i'm gonna redo it as a graphic novel so uh, they don't sparrows don't fly south in the winter like a lot of bigger right. birds they just scavenge in the gardens of wherever um and uh in in my story a plucky little sparrow uh decides no we should fly south like the big birds and so he gets a ragtag bag you know band of plucky sparrows together but the big birds don't like it the big the geese and the swans and whatever they think that's that shouldn't happen uh so they try and stop it from happening and that's called flying south oh i bet that's going to be such a beautiful uh, graphic novel as well that'd be awesome yeah i think so i mean that's partly why i'm doing it as a graphic yeah. novel i think it really really of- visual thing visual potential and you know them flying across the world and having battles with the other birds in the sky that's going to be great i think and also just boo to geese and swans they are the bullies of the bird world let's face it totally yeah exactly they really i've never trusted a goose i'm gonna put it out there 
No, geese and swans. No, they are, they're bad people. They are. I'm sorry. I'm genuinely terrified of them. I, they could break my arm and I would let them, probably. Yeah. Well, I don't think you'd have any choice. <laughs> no, just you got, cornered, you got cornered by swans. It's all over for you, Bex. All right, that seems fine. I've had a good run. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, Hate me. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. Um, well, David, thank you so much for telling us about everything and about Small Fry. And it's it's such a funny book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you very Benny's much. just such a nice character as well. Um, so thank congratulations you. and uh, good luck on the new musical. Thank you. Thanks, Bex. Bye-bye, everybody. That was the brilliant comedian David Baddiel about his new book, Small Fry. You've been listening to Fun Kids Meets, the podcast where we meet amazing people. And remember, you can hear more outstanding authors like David Baddiel on the Fun Kids Bookworm podcast with me, Bex, every other Wednesday. Bye.